So welcome to Regain's Organizational Spotlight Office Hours. I'm Tracy Bulandi and I'm a program associate with the Wallace Center. I work on the Resilient Agriculture and Ecosystem team, uh, which some of you may also know as a pasture project. And today we're um, on, the, we're all gathered here um, through Regain, the Regenerative Ag Idea Network, which is a member and partner-driven online community of practice that is designed for all regenerative ag educators, advocates, and leaders to come together online and discuss challenges, resources, successes, um, and provide peer expertise. Um, and this is focused uh, primarily in the Midwest, but also across the country. Uh, Regain is a racial equity centered um, network, and we make sure to support regenerative agriculture efforts that honor and integrate indigenous knowledge, practices, leadership, academic research, and technology um, in order to facilitate equitable participation and empowerment for all peoples. So the office hours are a chance for you to connect with a technical expert or regain member organization um, and ask any question related to their work or their expertise. Um, so we have upcoming office hours on April 28th with Marshall Johnson from National Audubon um, Society Conservation Ranching Initiative and Jared Lumen on May 12th uh, from SFA. If your organization is interested in providing a presentation, please feel free to reach out to me. I can share my information in the chat um, and just feel free to connect uh, to learn more or even volunteer to uh, provide a presentation. Um, I will request that attendees put their name, organization title, and why they joined today's office hours um, into the chat. And we'll be um, just to know who is joining today and what they're interested in. Um, today, speakers, we have a whole suite of people. And our topic is Greenland's Blue Waters. Um, continuous living cover practices um, and NRCS funding mechanisms to support regenerative agriculture. Our speakers today are Aaron Meyer with the director of Green, who is the director of Greenland Blue Waters, Linda Meshke with Rural Advantage and Jacob Grace uh, with Savannah Institute. Um, and also Marjorie Hedstrom has been helping and coordinate this um, uh, initiative as well. So with that, I will hand it off to our first presenter, which is um, Aaron. So I'll stop sharing and you can take it away. All right, thank you very much, Tracy. Yeah, and for this opportunity, um, let me minimize all of our faces. Um, I also want to thank Jacob and Savannah Institute because uh, we're fast tracking a few outputs around um, this work and uh, they allowed us to hop in here in April. So thanks for this slot. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so Aaron Meyer with Greenlands Blue Waters. Um, as these office hours are set up, uh, it is a bit of an introduction to the organization. And so we're kind of dual purposing it here. Uh, many of you know us. Um, so I'm going to do a high level review of Greenlands Blue Waters and then move the conversation to this idea of uh, ways to prioritize what we call continuous living cover in NRCS programs. Uh, let's see if I can advance. So Greenlands Blue Waters has uh, been around since about 2004. Um, it is a, a loose uh, kind of collaborative networked organization and it started that same way with a handful of people both in um, at land grant universities, research institutions and ag and environmental organizations uh, talking about kind of this gap between mostly research and what we know about research and, and then the, the outcomes we really wanna see in agriculture and how to build support for kind of a narrative around perenniality in agriculture. 
uh, with the idea of a systems level uh, positioning with initially quite a bit of focus on um, just increasing funding uh, through primarily USDA programs, but also through private foundations. Um, and, and that remains uh, a piece of our work as well as engaging uh, the network for other kind of systems level uh, activities. And I'll talk about those in a moment. Um, so the home base was initially and continues to be the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Ag. Uh, Steve Morse um, at the, now is the director of the Minnesota Environmental Partnership. He took a fellow position to form this idea of Greenland's Blue Waters in 2003, 2004. Um, and at the outset, there was then kind of formal sign-ons uh, by representatives from Langray universities and ag and environmental organizations. Um, we continue to focus, the, the, quite a bit of the impetus was, what can we do in the upper Mississippi River Basin to address the um, growing hypoxia in the Gulf, which we know continues to grow. So we um, continue to work with partners, mostly in the upper Midwest states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, um, our direct partnership with uh, in Missouri is through the Center of Agroforestry, uh, Mizzou uh, work down there. And then we have partners that continue to be engaged in the hypoxia uh, crews and analysis of that dead zone um, in Louisiana. And again, we work with a number of partners from academia, primary researchers, uh, educators, nonprofits. You know, many of you on, on this call um, that have joined us are, are partners as well. Um, so when we talk about continuous living cover, we really are talking about a, a, a way to uh, be productive and um, stack practices both at the farm scale uh, to develop a landscape scale of roots in the ground year round. Um, so our efforts, we try to organize around these kind of CLC production strategies, agroforestry being one. Um, then the perennials, uh, perennial forage, perennial grain, perennial biomass. Um, and then this kind of world of uh, cover cropping, stacked practices, winter annuals, new uh, and, and others that are familiar um, and work at integrating these strategies across again, individual farm systems, but then looking for that landscape scale change that brings environmental community economic uh, individual farm portfolio uh, benefits. Again, we take this network approach, really all of our work is really at this kind of institutional system level uh, activity to really change the narrative around what's possible through ag by providing examples and, and moving the needle a bit. Uh, so again, working with a variety of uh, different disciplinary um, focus uh, in research, as well as providing and partnering with those that are creating outreach and educational materials and capacity. We're doing more and more with policy, um, maybe not what you would call direct advocacy, but really looking at how can we help to form policy that supports adoption implementation or clean water um, you know, outcome goals uh, based on with a direct line to what's happening um, on our agricultural landscapes, um, things like that that we're working on in Minnesota, but also in other states with other partners. Um, from the beginning, uh, there's always been this line of understanding that we have to create the markets for farmers to make a decision on a new crop or a cropping system. So um, we've, we've been gap fillers from throwing the new grain in the back of our car and getting it over to a restaurant to uh, the point right now of uh, really working with, say, the entrepreneur that's developing a seed cleaning business, uh, working with a number of farmers or farmer co-ops to aggregate uh, crops. You know, a lot of this is very similar to those working in, uh, those of you working in food systems, local food systems. You have to aggregate, get it to market, have it be available for uh, not only um, an end user individual, but the end user where um, possibly the crop is an input for some kind of um, added value of food product. Um, and all of this then, of course, comes to how do we support our farmers to make the changes that we'd like to see uh, in a way that benefits uh, their, their farm business. So we, we kind of organize the things we do is just another way of organizing uh, our thinking um, that we're a connector, you know, all the way from farmer to research and, and these institutional and other agency partners in between. Uh, do a lot of collaborating, uh, both in terms of uh, shared fundraising and project and, uh, you know, defining project focus, 
uh, as well as things like uh, you know being part of the Regain platform and trying to engage others to um, you know learn from and work with each other with each other to make our uh, our work more effective and impactful. We do convening. We do have a conference. <laughs> Sometimes we all have conferences. Our last conference, uh, which Marjorie Hegstrom worked uh, quite a bit uh, on for us, uh, was in 2019 in Minneapolis. We hope to do one in 2022. We are not going to do one in 2021. Um, the NRCS cohort I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we do continue to staff and support the Midwest Perennial Forage Working Group. Uh, Jane Jewett is online here as well as our uh, uh, coordinator and facilitator of that and, and other members like Caroline and uh, others are, are on the line. So we continue to really support and see the value in that convening uh, as, as making the connections that people can't make necessarily um, in their daily work, but how do you connect with the like-minded extension uh, expert in a different state. And if you can come together and do that every once in a while, uh, we always see good benefit. And then just communicating both materials that we're developing, but trying to communicate for our network and, and bouncing good materials. Um, so I'll turn now to this kind of prioritizing continuous living cover conversation. Um, this started before I came through the doors of Greenlands Blue Waters. The, my predecessor, Richard Warner, had done a fair amount of um, interviews, discussing, uh, created a few white papers and did some research on being able to really tell this story that continuous living cover farming uh, is, is a very good use of NRCS funding to improve the natural resource uh, outcomes that, that the, those programs are designed for. Um, and that in, in some ways CLC is, you know, could be seen as a strategic way to implement many of the outcomes, whether you you know, espouse and call it sustainable ag, regenerative ag, restorative ag, all of these outcomes that we talk about that are social, economic, um, really could be strategized um, and realized through continuous living uh, cover farming. So the programs that you're familiar with, EQUIP, uh, Environmental Quality Incentives Program, and the Conservation Stewardship Program, focus, of course, on these improvements of things like water quality, soil health, and other habitat and natural resource concerns. Um, so again, you know, if we think about how that can significantly improve these resources of concern, uh, it kind of just moves into this logical uh, idea that we should prioritize that funding um, in those programs for our kind of, the kind of farming we're talking about. Um, so a couple of years ago, we started to engage folks that are serving on state technical committees uh, across the state and the region that we serve with the idea that we learn from each other, um, learn how we can champion these kinds of uh, potential funding priorities, or how do we uh, improve the application practice to uh, you know, put more points in the column for something that falls under the CLC umbrella, um, and really encourage you know, kind of this cross-state synergy where there isn't a lot, there aren't a lot of pathways um, necessarily from state NRCS to the next. Um, so how could we, start talking together um, and maybe taking a program that we see in one state and putting it in front of another state technical committee, at least for discussion and consideration. Um, so in the next few months, we have a few outcomes around this work. You'll be seeing um, some state by state reports. Um, we're going to pull uh, state uh, NRCS staff perspectives around the way that they think we should best do this in terms of opportunities for CLC integration, and then um, provide a couple profiles, um, really looking at some stories of implementing CLC with NRCS support. So you'll find um, case studies, you know, white papers, all the things we put together, uh, but to help you advocate for this kind of thing at, uh, on our website, uh, at this link, but if you go to greenlandsbluewaters.org and resources, you'll you'll find your way uh, to the NRCS section. So I'm going to close just with a few examples um, by state of the things we're kind of talking about, and then I'll turn this over to Linda Meschke. Um, in Illinois, they do have an equipped funding and ranking pools for things like alley cropping, forage and biomass planting, riparian buffers, uh, and silvopasture. In Iowa and FY19, they unveiled the CSB Grassland Conservation Initiative, uh, which really pays farmers to conserve grasslands and much of that is grazing land. Uh, Missouri, we, this is a prime example that we like to point to since uh, FY17 and every year has been supported in Missouri, um, an agroforestry initiative equipped funding pool 
And then ranking points that prioritize applications for things like alley cropping and silvopasture um, and other agroforestry practices. In Minnesota, again, my predecessor worked with um, kind of researchers at, that, uh, at the time of the intermediate wheatgrass Kernza and Minnesota NRCS staff to have uh, clearly articulated that 100% stands of Kernza are allowed uh, in uh, three practices, contour buffer strips, filter strips, and crosswind traps. Um, and you know, this was one piece, but what it really did was encourage the thinking around perennial plantings uh, in buffer strips, especially as Minnesota uh, passed its buffer law, as well as in things like uh, filter strips and, and other uses that could be considered uh, in terms of bioenergy -ener crops or agroforestry approaches. Um, Kernza on the plant list has also opened doors for additional state funding for partners to plant Kernza. Um, and right now in association with researchers on wellhead protection areas uh, and really study uh, season to season the reduction uh, in nitrate pollution, which we have seen. Um, and there's a handful of states or a handful of sites around the states, uh, the states in Minnesota. And we have a couple of those have about three seasons now and others are uh, in one and two seasons. But having that uh, discussion at the NRCS level um, provided um, kind of the comfortability for legislators to then say, yeah, let's take another step and fund some of these uh, uh, projects that not only can improve our rural water, uh, but um, uh, progress the research around Kernza and the agronomics. In Wisconsin, uh, they actually, Wisconsin pulls a lot of natural initiatives that any state can decide to fund uh, into their programming. And many of those, of course, call for things like cover crop and, and biomass plantings. Um, so that's just a few examples of what we see as um, you know, places to start uh, this conversation and share again across state lines. Um, so we are gonna wait for, excuse me, questions until after we all talk. <laughs> so I'm gonna stop sharing and pass this over to Linda Beschke. All right. See if I can get uh, myself online here. Am I showing up there? There you are, yep. Okay, so I, I was just gonna talk about uh, some opportunities for continuous living cover practices um, in hazelnut production. Um, one of the continuous living cover practices. And so, uh, let me figure out how I advance here. Any good clues on that? Oh, there we go. There you go, okay. Um, so uh, I wanted to start by just giving a framework for how um, the NRCS programs kind of work and in particular EQIP, which is the Environmental Quality Incentive Program. And so all of this is part of the Farm Bill, what we call the Farm Bill which technically is the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018. Um, these are rewritten every five years. So the next one will be in 2023. And um, if there are changes we, should, we think we'd like to see in the Farm Bill, um, it would be time to start preparing and getting those changes um, promoted and, and um, try to get them written into the next Farm Bill. And so um, there's different on the, let me see here. On my the right side of the screen, there are the different sections of the farm bill. It's the last one was one point eight billion dollar budget. All the programs in the farm bill are voluntary, and under the conservation title is where NRCS is um, with um, the Equip program as a program of the NRCS. Farm Service Agency is a sister agency, and um, I'll talk about that briefly. Um, so here are some common equip conservation practices offered through NRCS. This is just a short list of some that are relative to hazelnuts or getting um, continuous living cover on the landscape. For Minnesota, um, this list is actually 35 pages long with about 25 on each page of different practices available through the EQIP program. So um, um, there's a lot of opportunity 
Um, people just need to kind of learn and understand what's available or talk to their local NRCS um, district conservationist and uh, see what would work for their farm. But um, um, I guess I'm not gonna read off this whole list, but you can read it um, yourself. But you can see there's a lot of different approaches a person might have to getting a continuous living cover on the landscape um, utilizing this program. So the other thing with EQIP, it must address a resource concern. So in the case of hazelnuts, um, you won't be able to use EQIP to establish a commercial hazelnut crop for production, okay? You, you will be able to establish hazelnuts to reduce soil erosion or maybe improve water quality or capture um, CO2 and sequester carbon um, to increase the landscape diversity or improve wildlife and pollinator habitat or even to reduce on-farm fuel usage because you aren't doing those annual or several passes per year um, farm tillage practices. And so these are just some examples of how hazelnuts or other continuous living cover might improve uh, a resource concern. And the, the six resource concerns that are there on the left. And um, you can see how simple it is um, to justify, if you will, continuous living cover to address a resource concern. But you just need to know when you go in, you need to talk about it as you're addressing a resource concern. You're not trying to um, produce a money crop. And then um, on the bottom here, I have this national resource concern list and planning criteria, which is available at usda.gov. And that lists these different um, resource concerns. And then it has a several um, examples. And so it'd be good to read through that list and see how you might um, justify or how it might work for your um, farm that you have. And then um, who do you contact? Who you want to contact is the NRCS, which is the federal um, level um, and their sister agency, FSA. Um, you do need to establish a farm ID and a track number through FSA um, in order to sign up for NRCS. NRCS provides a technical assistance and so they can survey the land, um, give you um, design criteria, whatever it is that you need um, for your project. And then this FSA is a sister agency and, and they do the, the administration and financing. Um, the SWCD is connected into this. Um, SWCDs are at the state level soil and water conservation, whereas NRCS and FSA is the federal level. And so many times their offices are co-located and um, the SWCD can offer um, state or local level conservation um, opportunities. And so um, we're not focused on them today, but they do have a lot to offer that can help address some of these issues we're talking about. So just kind of big picture, there's federal level USDA programs and practices. Each state picks the ones that are appropriate for their state. For example, in Minnesota, we would have different practices than they have in Louisiana or Texas. Um, so um, the practices are, are different as you go from state to state. And then I live down here in Martin County in Minnesota and um, each county can select um, practices from the state list that are applicable um, to their area. So for example, I'm in corn and soybean country down here and um, practices that I might use are different than what we would find in Northeast Minnesota in the forestry area. <coughs> Excuse me. So here are some example practices um, that I pulled out and I just wanted to show that um, well in some cases the practice is, off, is offered in every state. In other cases it is not. So like alley cropping, Minnesota doesn't offer the, the alley cropping practice 
but um, the other four states in our area um, do. Um, Agroforestry, I don't have it on this list, but Missouri offers it, but no, none of the other um, states in the upper Midwest offer agroforestry. So when we look at the farm bill, the next farm bill, um, um, perhaps there's a way to elevate agroforestry um, as one of the options in, at the federal level, but also we can promote it at the state level and try to get it on the state list um, so that it's available for our landowners. Um, contour orchard and perennial crops is a fairly new practice. And um, there was recently some uh, opportunity for input on practices to the federal level. And this was one of them that was listed on there. And so we may be able to be seeing more of that um, in years to come, but um, something we could we could also support. And then you can see some of the other ones, um, you know, silva pasture, field borders, mulching. Um, when you do these practices with equip, sometimes there's there's multiple practices you do to get the practice installed. And so, for example, let's say you do a critical area planting and you're gonna establish some uh, perennial grasses on the landscape and put hazelnuts in there for wildlife habitat, okay? Then you might use the mulching practice in combination and the tree and shrub site preparation um, in collaboration with that critical area planting in order to get the site prepared and to mulch the, the tree plantings um, for weed control. Um, that's pretty simplified, but um, there are multiple practices that a person can do. Um, and so these are just some examples, but, but when you talk to your local NRCS district conservationist, they can advise you as to what's uh, most appropriate for the site. So that's what I have for, for today. I think there's a lot of opportunities here. I think we need to get people to understand what those opportunities are and, and how they can apply them on their farms. And I'll take questions at the end here. And um, Jacob, I think is next. Yeah, thank you, Linda. Thanks. Um, I'll just talk really briefly here. Um, I don't have any slides or anything. Hopefully we can get right to the questions, but I will drop a link in the chat here. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit about agroforestry specifically and how NRCS funding can support agroforestry, which um, I work with the Savannah Institute. So that's what we're all about. And um, as, as we've heard already from both Aaron and Linda, um, NRCS can support agroforestry practices through both the EQIP program and the CRP program. Um, but the practices, it, it varies by state what practices they can support. You can see a nice little interactive map in the link that I dropped in the chat where you can kind of figure out what practices are supported based on the state. Um, and then in order to get funding for those practices, they have to be connected with different practice standards. So there ends up being kind of a mix and match process, which can be pretty complicated and confusing for someone who's not on the inside. Once you get to um, combining agroforestry practices with the practice standards, and then also figuring out whether or not they're covered by a state. So the bottom line is uh, if farmers and community members uh, aren't pushing for these practices, they end up not getting funded. And I think that's a theme for probably all these different continuous living cover practices is that um, if people aren't asking about them, you know, especially if farmers aren't going into offices or, you know, contacting administrators about learning more about these practices, then they're not going to get funded because they want to base it on what people are actually doing. So that's something that the Savannah Institute is working on. Um, it's not something I'm directly involved with, but a number of our staff are working with the NRCS in both Illinois and Wisconsin, and we're hoping to branch out to other Midwest states to, um, to, uh, to work with NRCS and uh, kind of streamline processes to fund some of these practices, and also on the other end to work with farmers and landowners to help them know that 
funding and technical services available for these programs. Um, so yeah, I think I'll leave it off there and um, happy to answer any questions that I can. I'm just gonna jump in real quick to ask a first question. Um, was Savannah Institute involved in getting this page up? It's fantastic, this uh, USCA page. Uh, I don't think we can take credit for that, but um, the National Agroforestry Center uh, does a lot of great stuff uh, working within USDA to promote agroforestry, and I think they're mainly behind that webpage. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, it's an example of, you know, that external force <laughs> working with USDA and get more information out there, so thank you. Yeah, so thank you to our presenters and um, yeah, we'll open it up to the rest of the attendees if they have any questions um, that they want to ask about the presentation. Um, thanks for that. Uh, that was all really interesting. I'm curious if you all have a sense um, about the extent to which NRCS staff in each of these states are are like talking to each other, collaborating, um, and if that's that's part of this is is like is like facilitating. Maybe that's happening, but like facilitating agency staff cross state lines to talk about like what some of these programs look like in their respective states. I'll, I'll answer um, that a little bit, but then I would love to hear from those that are participating on the state technical committees. I do when I can in Minnesota, but I haven't been a, a long-term member. Um, but I will say that is kind of a little baby step we're taking with these opportunity reports with kind of saying, hey, we're doing this work, we're trying to prioritize it, we're working across state lines with those on your committees and, and kind of get their state perspective, but trying to open up that channel a little bit more. Um, and I, I don't know formally, I'm sure there are ways they connect, but I will bring up one example um, through another uh, funding source. We're working quite a bit on intermediate wheatgrass Kernza and trying to open up uh, a channel of uh, conversation between Minnesota and Wisconsin, because again, Minnesota had um, you know, formalized some description in their practices and, and plant um, uh, information materials. And, and it's kind of bouncing around and it, it, you know, so it's all relational. It depends who knew who, is there someone new in that position? Um, is someone comfortable with maybe, you know, talking up or down in a hierarchical chain that may not be analogous from state to state? So it always comes back to who knows who and who's comfortable, but we are looking at ways both through the Kearns account and this funding that uh, so far has been supported by Walton for GLBW to do that exact same, that thing, Jane, because we need to get to the staff as well as um, our supportive champions in the committees. But yeah, what do others uh, think about that? Or those of you that are serving or have more than I have, um, do you hear a reference uh, to other state staff in those state tech committees or other state practices? I think there is some cross state um, discussions within certain topic areas. You know, like the grazing people are talking to the grazing people in the other states or the forestry, et cetera. Um, NRCS does have regions. And so um, perhaps within those regions, um, there's more collaboration between states. Um, our region goes north and south, you know, down to Texas and um, I forget what's called the central region, maybe. Um, so I think there's maybe four regions across the nation. I, I sat on a on our county tech um, committee some years ago for many years. And um, I wanna observe that after I'd been on it for a while and then I'd also had my own experience as a farmer um, applying for and being granted an EQIP grant. So I sort of wore a couple different shoes in that capacity. I had the distinct feeling that at least in our county, they really needed people like me on their tech committee to call out and ask for certain um, practice standards as though, as though they didn't wanna be the one championing it, but they, were, they wanted them on the short list. They wanted them on the priority list but they didn't want to be the one to bring them up. They wanted to hear from constituents or landowners. I don't know really, I don't know how they saw me because I was wearing a, 
a nonprofit hat and a grazing hat. And I was a woman. Oh, my God. They were just about peed in their pants to bean count having a woman farmer walk in. So I guess what I'm saying is that um, my sense then, which is now a couple of few years outdated, was that um, there's a painful amount of distinction from one county to another. Aaron, you mentioned the relationship, the power of relationships, and that that's both infuriating and perfectly normal. And also the sense that in some counties, at least in my county, they really needed to have these prioritize these priorities validated from from out here in radio land. And so um, to go back, back to what I think, uh, well, Jacob and Linda, you, you were both strongly and know what practices are available and to go in having done our homework and advocated for practice standards that may or may not be prioritized in our given county. And, and so Aaron, when I think about your work going across state, um, uh, there needs to be a component of encouraging that it trickle down and get to the agents on the ground, no matter whether they believe having some connectivity. Leave in continuous living cover or the, the particular. <laughs> Think you locked up there, Caroline. But I would just support um, what you're saying is yeah, that so that's just my two bits. They they seem to need from out here in farmland. Yeah, and um, what you're talking about is the local work group. So each county in the nation has a local work group, and that local work group. Um, landowners and farmers um, are supposed to come in once a year, they have them, and um, discuss what the priorities are for that county, and then um, what's, what's the priority practices, and then that's, yes, I, I that's can theoretically where the, where the dollars should be allocated, and then each county submits that to the state, and then the state decides their overall state priorities based on those county inputs. So it does start at that, at that local farmer level. Input from the farmers goes to the district office, they turn it into the state, the state turns it into the national. And that's theoretically how it's all driven. But if you don't have that local input, then, then you don't get the end result we're all hoping for. So those local work group meetings will be coming up and I would encourage you to encourage whoever to go to those and participate. That's the, that's a real key thing that I think is kind of missing in the big picture. Yeah, and I, I just wanna, yeah, I really appreciate that being brought, and it, 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 we return to this in these conversations over and over again, and it just starts at that local level because yeah, the state staff is needs to be driven by kind of constituent uh, input, um, and and I think we've been thinking at the GLBW level. We're not built, you know, for that kind of grounded touch at that capacity, but continue to formulate like how could this be a really good um, collaborative uh, effort in terms of you know reaching out, developing relationships, providing um, really TA to uh, move those priority statements um, in a direction we'd like. So yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I was gonna ask, is the cohort looking into the technical assistance side? What are the limitations, even if the programs, even if the practice standards are available through the programs or the funding is there? Um, and then how much of that are partners in Greenland's Blue Waters um, offering to you know, provide some of that planning and technical assistance through cooperative agreements with NRCS? Yeah, we're, uh, so we've, it's kind of another, um, 
uh, what do you call it, the kind of bucket we're working in. And I just wrote down, like, we got to get these two together. Um, I will say GLBW has had a history of, of kind of trying to provide materials to uh, technical service providers or um, building some inroads into those agencies that uh, provide a lot of that TSP. Um, and right now we're doing the same thing. We have kind of a roadmap project of, you know, we always ask the same questions. Where do farmers go <laughs> to get information? How could we maybe target a few and really zero in on some um, like prioritizing the train the trainer within these agencies, right? That host these trainers and then prioritize CLC as being uh, a, a kind of an umbrella framework and then you got to get it all delivered. So I, I just, yeah, we, so we're not doing anything right now. We're not doing, I mean, not on the ground and we're not, uh, it's not necessarily in the NRCS cohort context, but we are looking at kind of next steps or maybe a next generation of trying to get in front of um, technical service providers with uh, really renewed material with better and more recent research and you know, it's not like we haven't been talking about this stuff for a while, uh, but there are new um, uh, things to turn to in terms of defensible arguments and research-based outcomes. Uh, so yeah, and if you have any thoughts or suggestions in terms of like, you know, focus on NRCS or focus on soil water conservation in terms of the delivery, uh, happy to hear more about that. Any questions from others on online? Uh, Tracy, can you hear me again? I'm going to try yes. it one more time. Yes. Here. Okay. Um, so, does, does did Winrock are, are, do you do outreach to NRCS for this for this presentation this format? Um, this Just, series of workshops, just for example. Um, well, maybe Jane can. Yeah, answer. short answer is no. We, we, there are some, some folks who work for NRCS who are part of the network, but we have not done um, targeted outreach to, to NRCS. But I think it's a great idea. There's, it's definitely relevant. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know what happens. You do outreach to a thousand people and you might get 10 people or maybe you'll be lucky to get 15. I, we all understand that. Um, I just think because, because no matter how much, how much rules are written down, blah, 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 at the end of the day, it's gonna come down to the heart and the willingness of individuals. And so that's the same in NRCS. It's the same in our own organizations. So to me, if you can attract the passion and the commitment of, of one more NRCS agent or 10 more NRCS agents, then we're just 10 more warm bodies down the road thinking like us and working with their own 10 or 15 or 100 farmers. Yeah. The many years that I've been involved in, in this type of work, um, I've found NRCS to be very supportive of this type of thinking. Um, the challenge is, is to, you know, they operate from a manual with a lot of, a lot of manuals with a lot of rules and fences um, as to what they can do and not do. And so if it doesn't come from the ground up, um, you know, and doesn't get that priority on their list, then they're not spending time on it. So the key for us is, is how do we get that elevated, get these topics elevated so they are on their list and they do spend time with them. And I, I don't think that's an unreasonable challenge for all of us to work on that. I, to that point, I um, be interested to hear like what, like partner organizations like Wall Center, for example, other organizations working in this space, how can we support the work that you all are doing to advocate for for particular practice standards. That's a great question. I will just say we're trying to use the Regain platform um, and have a. I'm going to say it's a work group. What's the? <laughs> I'm going to say the wrong thing. Discussion What's your, group, discussion working group. group. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the discussion group. Um, yeah, to really center this work, um, you know, I. I 
those that have been part of the cohort conversation know that. I mean, we haven't really formed a cohort cohort, right? We've had some sharing time together over the next, last couple of years, and we'd like to build a place where um, this discussion can continue. And, you know, certainly uh, we'd need to keep that uh, live and interesting to people. But I will say even that we're, we're trying to build that out. And, and I don't know how uh, Winrock is looking at um, not only kind of continuing the management of regain, but yeah, how do you maybe uh, sift through what you're seeing there um, as possible? Like, okay, here, here's a gap or here's maybe a way that we can help in the context of our organization. I mean, it might even be that as we can get more um, material and engagement on those uh, discussion platforms. Yeah, we're, that's definitely an ongoing conversation for us. I know Jane's on, I, I don't know if she's able to concentrate here, but yeah, just wondering Jane, if you, um, any thoughts around um, how should we should be focusing around grazing and forage that, you know, you've seen maybe gaps or in, inconsistent support from NRCS in the past? Um, well, so something I hear over and over again from the working group members during our regular conversations is that they're by and large a little bit leery of the uh, program support because they've seen over and over that they get people signed up for programs and the practices get implemented and then the contracts end and the money goes away and the practices go away. And so there's a feeling like it's better in the long term to focus on getting people to do the right thing because they believe in it rather than because there's a program supporting them. So I think part of that is because historically the programs have been so robust for corn and soybeans and there are extra hurdles and it's harder and um, just less supported to get the program support for forages and grazing. And I think that might be changing a little bit. I think if, you know, if it was as easy and as common and as expected to go to your FSA office and get your support for perennial forage the way you do your corn and beans, you know, you just, you do it because that's what you do, um, then it might be different. But that's kind of the mindset that, um, that our working group members have had. I would say, yeah, it's confusing if you're not used to the system, the NRCS system. And, um, you know, I think people have to understand what that is and they need to understand the timelines. Um, a couple of years ago, when you signed up for an EQIP practice, um, it didn't get funded for like two years. So if you wanted to put in you know, anything, um, you sign up and then two years later, you get okay to go ahead and do it. Well, um, if that's if that's the way it is, then the farmers need to understand that and need to be willing to accept that timeline. Most of them might go in today and want to do something this spring yet. And so um, I know that that varies from state to state but, and the delivery has changed, I hope for the better in the last two years, but um, um, there are some frustrations in, in using the program. Maybe I'll add to, yeah, I really appreciate you bringing that up, Jane. I knew when I called on you, you bring something good up. <laughs> that, um, um, you know, and I think we all, whenever we're working in this, like NRCS is one place, right? Um, and it's got limitations and we can always talk about changing those or is that where you want to put your effort? Um, but where can we open up, um, you know, kind of some uh, gateway opportunities maybe for early adopters? Um, but the thing that we struggle a lot with um, within the GLBW kind of frame is we're talking about productive practices and these are not necessarily programs. They're conserva conservation-minded and they aren't necessarily 
uh, for production at a wider scale, um, or it would be hard to say, talk about, uh, you know, a, a much expanded perennial grain landscape and thinking that NRCS isn't going to necessarily be a part of that. And at least these programs were, were focused on. So, you know, th and, and I would love to be able to build a discussion place where we're talking more about other avenues uh, for this that might be other policy platforms or, you know, other practice and implementation opportunities. Um, and I'll just call out, I know Liz, you, you all have been working so much with like the soil water conservation districts and in like how, how can either funding and TA and support help those reach out to farmers um, to like make those changes based on other, other things and support can help them, but it isn't about creating that support long-term um, in terms of like a cost share, um, if I'm saying that right, but. Right, right. And with that too, um, just like this conversation is, you know, it's exciting. And uh, there are some other platforms that are also having similar discussions. And it would be great to bring everybody kind of to one spot, if that's Regain or posting it somewhere. Um, I would love for it to be Regain. Um, but, you know, let's yeah, let's just kind of keep the ball rolling in the same direction with um, some of the other states and organizations that are having some of these policy discussions and more of the technical side too. Um, yeah, so I think maybe that's something I can talk with you a little more about, Erin, and um, how do we bring those all together, but yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. We'll follow up on that, thank you. I think one of the things we could all do is encourage uh, the people we work with in our organization to participate in those local work groups or maybe write a letter to their county NRCS district conservationist saying, um, you know, we think in our county we should support grazing or more continuous living cover or whatever the language is they want to use or supports your group. Um, so that it gets on the record that there is a interest in that and um, a need for those types of practices to get on the landscape. One of the things that Wallace Center might be able to do with their national reach is, um, is work on the public uh, perceptions and the public statements about programs that are available. So I think about the radio stations in farm country that announce, you know, what the LDPs are, what the loan rates are, you know, it's time to get in there and do your um, your paperwork for the spring for your corn and bean production. If they could be encouraged to also say the, the forage related things in those broadcasts, I think that would help too to start normalizing it. Um, yeah, we, you know, a number of years ago, one of the MISA fellows did a project to get the, the national grain price reporting system through agricultural marketing service to produce organic grain reports in addition to conventional grain. And I think that was one piece that really helped normalize organic grain production that there were actually price reports. So that might be a thing that doesn't seem like a big deal, but if it's on the radio every week in farm country, it could be. Yeah, I think I had a follow up question related to that, Jane, you mentioned that, you know, a person can get X amount of support automatically when they're asking kind of the conventional questions um, or asking for support on the conventional side, and then um, not so much with some of these CLC practices. And I'm wondering, do you think that's primarily because of lack of um, access and information about those practices at their county offices or that the county offices are actually not interested in promoting that? In other words, are they unaware or not interested? Uh, I think it's actually, I think a lot of it is the weight of decades of US farm policy that was geared towards production of bushels and bushels and sure. just habit, you know, yeah. a lot of habit and a lot of um, historical program infrastructure that's built up around the cash grain that 
that just hasn't been there for a perennial forage. Right. It is two different programs under the farm bill because it's the corn and soybeans and, and other commodity crops under the commodity section. And we're talking about the um, conservation section. Now that doesn't mean we can't promote it. And, and I agree with, with Jean that having that on the radio, you know, when they do the markets or, you know, around here, they do the markets every hour, you know, during the business day. Uh, but um, I always call it, they have their corn and soybean blinders on and they don't think about, they don't think beyond that, you know, to grazing or, or anything else that would be conservation minded. Yeah, so this sounds like a really great discussion and um, a lot of good suggestions for us on what, you know, how we can use Regain to do more outreach to people and get more people engaged around these type of discussions. Um, I would encourage this to continue on Regain um, so that, you know, we can get all these ideas in one place. Um, and I just want to thank our presenters and attendees today. Uh, I'll be sending out this presentation um, along with additional resources to everyone. So um, thank you for coming and uh, hopefully we'll see you and talk soon. Great. Thanks for your thank time. You. Thank, thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Take care.